Hey, everybody, this is uh, Dan and Kenny and Jeet and Jesse from Agoric. And uh, lots of people heard the news. Um, uh, build went out to 40,000 accounts plus last night. Uh, so it's all very exciting. Um, and one of the things you can do now is stake your build. Um, and somebody, um, we're going to ha have a lot more about this at the uh, upcoming community call on April 6th. Uh, so we do those once a month, uh, and they're, I think they're, they're uh, Twitter spaces lately, but anyway, you'll hear more about this uh, on the coming Wednesday, but in the short term, um, so I can, I can delegate, I can do some staking, who should I stake with, and how do I do that, and all that kind of stuff. Well, the, the how do you do it, uh, there's various guides on how to use Kepler out there, I'm not going to go into that today, um, but that's the tool you can use to do it. Um, but the Agoric company had some tokens to, to delegate. And uh, we um, announced a delegation program on January 28th and invited um, validators to come and say, we're a good validator, you should, you should delegate to us. Um, and so the kinds of things we were interested in is, you know, hardware and, and software and how good is their team at keeping up uptime and stuff like that. Um, so then they did apply and we did delegate to many of them. Uh, so now many of you in the community are in, the, in a similar position. Uh, Jeet or Kenny or Jesse, do you want to pick one of these for fun? Just pick a validator. I would say Steakfish should be in there, right? They're always everywhere. Yeah, Steakfish, that's a really wonderful crew. I don't see Steakfish. Uh, how about um, Chorus One? Are they in here? Do not see them. <laughs> Strike it out. Okay. If they're really big, it could be that we didn't need to delegate to them. And so they, you know. True. Well, let's go with Staken. You know, they're they're number 27 down here. And I saw them in Discord this morning. They seem cool. like a pretty excitable bunch too. Cool. So um, one can find them on the blockchain. Uh, there they are. So that's their, you know. Uh, so Jesse, what do you remember about the, the the survey they did and and some of this stuff? So I remember quite a few things. Um, we asked the validators things about how they operate their businesses. I ran them through the ringer with about thirty security questions about everything from how they're using two-factor authentication, what cloud providers they use, um, all kinds of fun stuff. And then we've also asked them, you know, what are they willing to do to help us build the network out and make it more secure and resilient? We've had folks who um, wanted to run an archive node, run an RPC node or something similar uh, so that we've got a couple of extra tools to keep our mainnet up and running. And I think we've also got a few folks who are really dedicated to developing some documentation uh, for other validators so that we get a really strong body of knowledge um, and folks, you know, really get in a place where they can help each other out. There's one other thing that I did ask them for. Um, in the long term, we'd like to have effectively a community security emergency response team, um, a place where, you know, our core developer team, if we find security bugs, is able to speak directly with validators and we can figure out what we need to do um, to protect the network and upgrade the chain. Obviously, we would not be telling the validators what to do. They tell us the block height, you know, they tell us if they agree with our synopsis and our potential technical resolution. But because our validators are so close to the code, they're typically going to be the ones who find a bug or a weird edge case or something that's going to be really, really valuable to um, our engineers at Agoric and to me. So we've also, you know, mentioned We'd like them to follow our process for reporting a security bug. Um, um, and yes. So, uh, I guess I should have asked the question a little differently because there's a bunch of stuff. So, because we got to talk to them on the phone or something like that, lots of them. And I think our 40,000 new build holders are not going to have that much information mostly. Um, 
let me step back and just a couple basics. There's kind of two basic risks. One, so if you delegate to a validator, um, one is that they uh, will be unavailable. <laughs> they won't keep their 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 validator. So basically, every block, every six seconds, to dump, to dump, to dump, all the validators vote. And so one of the one one bad thing that could happen is your validator that you delegated to doesn't vote. Mm -hmm. They're you know they don't answer the phone, whatever the heck. So that's one bad thing that could happen. And the other bad thing that could happen is that they vote twice, yes and no, um, or maybe even yes and yes at different times or something like that. So those are the two bad things that happen. If they if they if they fail to vote, you won't get a little bit of rewards. Not that big a deal. If they vote two different ways, <laughs> bad things happen. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. You're talking about double signing, I believe. Right. Do we have like some kind of factor of how much stuff gets lost if somebody double signs? I need to double check this number. Um, I probably am going to have to go straight to the source code. So I can't tell you off the top of my head. Right. right. But if someone double signs, that's essentially uh, a validator or a node operator, like original sin. <laughs> Right. And you do definitely get punished. I cannot recall the number off the top of my head, but you get slashed. Um, you lose a little bit of your stake, as do folks who delegate to you. Uh, so it's definitely not fun to go through. So does this slash fraction double sign 0 0.05, does that sound right? That sounds right. So anyway, it's something in there. Anyway, but yeah, that's, so that's bad. So if you're if you're trying to stake to these validators, I think Dan, the point you're making is they've got some operational requirements. Mm -hmm. They have to have um, a node that you know isn't going to double sign a transaction right. because that's bad, and you get punished for it. And if you've chosen a validator, you know who isn't able to explain how they've uh, built their node to not double sign or what they're doing to make sure that their validator keys that they use to sign things don't get stolen, um, that, that's an important signal to look for. Um, right. The other thing that I'm thinking about too is you mentioned that if they're not voting or um, you know maybe they have a little bit of unpredicted downtime, it happens. Uh, validators can fall in a ranking and that impacts um, rewards. That is something to keep an eye out for. But for the most part, the only way um, or the best way that you're going to figure out how your your validator that you've delegated to is performing is going to be one of these um, block explorers that Dan has on the screen now. Right, and so our, they're all doing pretty good. At least the ones that are in the voting set are, are keeping at least 98% uh, uptime. So, oops, there's another, oh yeah, this Big Dipper dot live is, is um, I guess that's one thing to, that I always think about is unlike web two, where there's just one website, web three, you can have lots of websites looking at the same blockchain. Yeah, uh, yeah. One thing I've noticed too, um, so, the reason we're, you know, we can't require like 100% uptime. That's a little silly, um, mm -hmm. especially because sometimes you have to restart a node or resync because one of, you know, one of these, one of these folks may have updated their architecture or their software. Right. Sometimes, um, depending on, you know, how plugged in these validators are will actually go out of their way to give you a heads up that they're, you know, having a planned maintenance session. This is something we're used to seeing in some of the apps we use, like Slack or Miro or whatever else. But um, they definitely will give you a heads up when they've planned, you know, to be offline for a few seconds. And if they do go out, we have asked that they also say, hey, we had an oops, sorry about that. We'll do better. Right. Cool. Um, so those are some of the risks and some of the ways we looked into them. And then uh, we've also, I've also seen questions about um, unlocking and who has the tokens and all that kind of stuff. And so um, one of the things that, that makes it straight, uh, understandable that people have these questions, what did I do with it? Did I throw you had it up, you, you, yeah, you backed out of it. Uh, okay, so we found the transaction. Okay, so yeah, there it is. Um, so the the there was this coin list sale, and it used a you know kind of Web two credit card, whatever the heck you got your money to to coin list crypto, whatever the heck, and then uh, it looked like you they they sold you some tokens, great, but um, 
then it was, you know, it's like, does CoinList have them? Does Agoric have them? What the heck? Okay, so now they're on the blockchain. Enough of that. Um, so that's all clear. Then, so there's there's been questions about when the tokens get distributed, which just happened last night, and then versus when they get unlocked, which may, means that you could transfer them or do, do other things like that. So I was kind of curious to know from the blockchain uh, when these things get unlocked. So my understanding is that uh, we've used this thing called a periodic vesting account or whatever. Um, that's what the blockchain calls it. And everybody has this, this schedule that starts at some number of seconds since the beginning of whatever the heck. And then there are these vesting periods where after so much time, so many of your build uh, become uh, unlocked and so forth. And Kenny, have you managed to make all any of that easier to read? Yeah, but here's some people tools that people can use sort of on their own regardless. Uh -huh. So if you copy that number, that start time, there's uh -huh. a there's a website if you just google uh, unix time there's it's a nice little website that you just pop in the the number yep the epoch converter pop it in there and then it will tell you what that date is and hit convert so that's the starting time is january right. 1st of 2022 mm -hmm. and then if you add uh, in that back in the in that that transaction there so there are 13 periods which actually I think is uh, it's by month. So this is actually one year of a vesting period. Mm -hmm. And so for, for the from or the, not the from address, but the to address that if that were my address, right? So you could search mm -hmm. for that address on this transaction here. And then I could, you can see the amount of build there. Now this is the lowest amount meaning the lowest denominator. So you'd have to divide that by six in order to get the sort of the whole number, so to speak. But so that's- this was really 400 build roughly. Yeah, exactly. And then um, there's a length right underneath that which is also in seconds so you add that to the starting time and that will be the end of the first period and the amount is how much you get in that period and then you keep going and you do that for the next year roughly speaking so we're, okay here's my console so this is this plus this number so yeah. i got that one mm -hmm. that so should, the first it should be about a month so this starting time seems to be january 1st 2022 yep that's, I guess, the sale date. And then the first time the tokens become unlocked is July 1st, 2022 at exactly 1700 GMT. All right. Yeah, it was a two, there, there was actually two, it's now that I remember, I think for CoinList, there were two schedules, right? There was like a two year and a three year, if I'm not mistaken. It was a six month and one year. Six month and one it, year, oh, or whatever it is. That's, yeah. that's how it was evenly divided between the periods. Right. And so that's how you can tell from the blockchain when your tokens are gonna unlock. Right. Um, you know, and also maybe one of those, the, all of our validators have committed to creating tools for the community. Maybe a right. nice tool that one of the, the validators would like to, to create would be something like putting in an address and giving, and then the website would give a schedule of when uh, tokens right. unlock. That'd be cool. a kind of a cool tool. Cool chart and everything. Yeah. G, what do you remember about um, organize, getting in touch with these validators and stuff? Yeah, so um, as part of the delegation application process, there's about a 70 question questionnaire that I put together um, going over things such as general operations. Uh, Jesse had a great input about 30 security questions. So based on the, the entirety of that questionnaire, uh, we went through and we um, reviewed and scored all the different validators. And then we came up with a list of about roughly 70 that were chosen to receive uh, 500,000 Bill delegation from the Agoric Opco. And cool. uh, a lot of those validators, almost all of them are the ones you see on the validator pledge pages. So if you take a look, um, you can see the general, uh, there's a general pledge of the top 10. And then beyond that, um, there's a category one and category two. Category one is infrastructure related. So as Kenny was mentioning, this is where certain validators stated that they would build out certain dashboard and analytics tools, uh, run RPC nodes, whatnot. And then the second category is um, community growth, where they agreed to be part of various uh, community growth projects like uh, Twitter spaces, creating educational content, creating uh, security run books and whatnot. So uh, yeah, we're looking forward to everyone on the validator side, um, really helping with both the network growth as well as the community growth of the org. And just to chime in really fast, sorry I stole your thunder earlier, Jeet, but you did a wonderful job digging through the piles and piles of data that we got back. 
Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, one other thing I would like to say is that working with the, the developer group is really fun. <laughs> they help each other out a lot and stuff. I, you know, uh, one of them comes up with a question, usually one of the other ones answers it. But if it's something that only the team can answer, then, you know, I go have to go find the guy that really knows because I don't really know anything. Um, and then sort of share that information and they, they help help each other out. The next guy comes along. So the validator group that we've got is really, really great. Uh, and once again, everybody stay tuned for the April 6th community call. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your time. Oops.